Hello again. Before we move on with other expander devices, let's just cover a few bits and pieces that I forgot earlier about the uh, interfaces and the detectors. So firstly, on the interface, just a bit of um, positioning advice. So you're going to place the interface probably in a relatively high position. Um, it may be high up on a wall somewhere. It may even be in a building riser, electrical riser or something like that, but it will be wherever you um, you surveyed for in the first place. So, um, and we'll talk about surveys at some point. Um, just something to be aware of. Obviously in this top uh, left hand corner it will be if you're facing the unit, um, is your diversity antennas. Now they must be at least 400 mil away from any metal objects. So, um, so keep them a good distance away from uh, things like metal ceiling tiles and um, uh, pipe work and things like that that may be on the wall. Uh, the other thing to consider is that the, um, the advice for fitting these things is to keep them at least um, two meters three dimensionally away from any um, noisy electrical equipment. So noisy electrical equipment will be things like uh, lift switch gear, um, it might be um, uh, plant inside plant rooms, um, it might be very high voltage cables. So just be aware of things like that. Um, they will create very high background noise which can affect the signals that are coming into this unit. So the advice is keep them two meters uh, distance away from anything like that. Sometimes that's quite difficult to do and I have actually seen these boxes fitted in electrical risers um, and working very well. So uh, just a few things to bear in mind when sighting uh, your interface. Uh, the other things that we need to speak about before we move on is the detectors. So obviously you've got the expander detector here um, and that is based on our uh, the mechanical properties of our Orbis product. It also has a few of the electrical properties of Orbis inside and it's not an Orbis detector because the Orbis detector is conventional and obviously takes a lot more voltage. Uh, this takes about 3 volts. Uh, but it has things like drift compensation and transient rejection built into it. So drift compensation is electronic compensation built into the detector to compensate for build up of dust and contamination inside the device. It does mean that if it does get dusty and dirty in the sensing chamber, which is way inside this detector, um, you could end up with a, a dirty detector warning at the panel. To clean it, it would be a case of blowing through uh, the detector with high pressure air, or even better, vacuuming the device. So literally get a vacuum cleaner, put it on the top, um, and give it a good old vacuum out. So, uh, so that's two methods of uh, cleaning the device. Other than that, generally it's just changing it over. Transient rejection. Transient rejection is false alarm immunity that has been built in by the manufacturers. And it basically means that the detector needs to see smoke for a longer period of time before it activates. And it's to try and cut down on the problem that we've got with um, false alarms in the UK, which is cost UK taxpayer about a billion pounds a year. So uh, so that's been built into the expander product. Um, and um, just to bear in mind that if you're testing these devices, that it will take a lot longer for it to activate in its normal operation. So when you're blowing smoke in with aerosols, um, again, it will need to see that smoke for a longer period of time. Don't be tempted to swamp it with smoke to make it go off because it won't make it any better. Um, it will take at least 30 to 40 seconds to activate. So the general advice is put your solo tester over or your testifier over the product. Uh, give it a half second burst of smoke. Obviously the testifier will continue to um, add smoke anyway, naturally. Um, every 10 seconds, just give it another half second burst. And it should go off in about 30 seconds in its normal operation. Now there is a method of testing these using the um, fast test on the interface, which we'll show you in a later video. So um, 
The other things to look at on here, on the base, are the locking mechanism. So here at the top, we've got this little hole, which is uh, which will take a 1.5 mil driver and drive a screw through the detector into the base, which will then lock the base in position and stop people stealing the batteries if they can get hold of the detector, of course. If it's way up high, you don't need to worry about it. And the other way of locking is to take out this thin piece of plastic on the rim of the base and there's a little mechanism inside the detector. I don't know if you can see that, uh, the little triangular thing at the top there. So just there. And that will lock into that position in the base. And then once you've got the detector in there, you use a 1.5 mil driver in the hole in the detector bay, in the detector, push the driver outwards and turn, and you should be able to remove the detector. Um, to remove these from very high ceilings, hopefully they won't be locked, and they will fit into all the no climb removal tools that are available. So um, hopefully a few tips there that will help you out. That's the smoke detector. You can also fit a heat detector if you want to. We do an A1R and a CS heat detector. So the A1R is a 57 degree heat detector with a rate of rise element. The CS heat detector is a 90 degree heat detector with no rate of rise. So your A1R is your most sensitive heat detector for your areas where you're not expecting any quick transients of temperature. And your CS would be used in places like industrial kitchens and boiler rooms where you may get fast transients of temperature change. See you for the next video.